Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a very close look at that split screen in front of you. On the right side of the screen is India's top gun, Air Chief Marshal B.S. Danoha. On the left side of the screen is the Pakistani Air Force Chief, Mujahid Anwar Khan. Both chiefs are flying fighter aircraft. But can you spot the difference? The Indian chief is captaining the MiG-21 fighter jet, while the Pakistani Air Force chief is sitting in the rear of the cockpit. The Indian air chief is flying that fighter jet. The Pakistani chief is out for a joyride. When you are 62 years old, have 41 years of service, and are a few days away from retirement, you have to have crazy streak to want to fly a four-decade-old fighter jet yourself. But hey, don't all fighter pilots have a crazy streak in them? Our special guest at the India Today Conclave has a whopping 3,140 hours of flying experience. He was commissioned into the Indian Air Force in June 1978. Like our new hero, Wing Commander Abhinandan Vartaman, Danoha II ejected from a MiG-21 fighter when he was in the cockpit and was back <laughs> flying in nine months' time. He led the 17th Squadron, the Golden Arrows, during the Kargil War, and for his brave and innovative attack plans, he was awarded a Yudh Seva medal. This is the first time ever a sitting, serving chief of the Indian Air Force is joining us at the India Today Conclave. And there couldn't have been a more opportune time because never before in India's contemporary history has the Air Force been quite as much in the public eye as it has been this year. I want you to join me in welcoming to the India Today Conclave, the Chairman of the Chief of Staff's Committee, Mastermind of the Balakot Airstrikes, Ace Fighter Pilot, India's Top Gun. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear a thunderous round of applause as I introduce and welcome Air Chief Marshal B.S. Danoha. Air Chief Marshal, welcome to the Thank India you. Today Conclave. Under your watch, the Air Force has been more in the public eye than it ever has before. We don't have a cockpit, so you can't take off, unfortunately. <laughs> but tell us, you know, all the time, the limelight, I'm a Fauji Bacha myself, all the time, the limelight's on the Indian Army. You know, you've taken the limelight away from the Army, and now you have it on the Air Force. No, it is not like that. You see, the Indian Army is uh, fighting a daily battle in counterinsurgency. It is not that they, 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 they want to come in the limelight. No, they are in the limelight because they are fighting every day. That is they are there. And yes, Air Force was called upon to fight, so we fought in that thing. So that particular period of time, who was doing what? And everybody has a role to play. So they have a role and they are, they are, they are doing it very well. And we were asked to do a role and I thought we did that also very well. But what you did was remarkably special and special because not since 1971 has the Indian Air Force on purpose and deliberately crossed the line of control and delivered such an effective message. When the whole airstrike was being planned, Air Chief Marshal, what was going through your head? No, it is not like that. It is the Indian Air Force, uh, even in, after the parliament attack in December 2001 and uh, after the 2611 had always said that uh, we are ready and we are ready to go and the, actually the decision, uh, the making is the, on the political leadership. Armed forces are supposed to be ready for the contingency and prepared and trained and equipped to, to carry out the contingency. It is the political leadership that takes the call and then decide that yes, we should use which arm of the armed forces they are going to use. So that is their call and I think the risk taking has been, uh, major risk taking has been from their side. So we, but were, we were always ready. To what extent do you think things have changed? I remember you having a key operational role in 2001, and I want to share with everyone sitting here a small anecdote. This was after Parliament had been attacked, and at that time, too, the whole option of using the Air Force as a strike uh, weapon was being assessed. And at that time, some intelligence officer apparently came up to you and gave you a broad description of where yeah. the terror launch pad was. <laughs> and uh, the Air Chief Marshal no, no, said, no. 
what do you want me to do? You know, you, I need coordinates. Unless I have yeah. coordinates, how do I go in and strike? How no, do you it think is not that. we've it changed? Is, it, it is, that's the focus of, you know, the, when human intelligence is given, it has got a particular input and uh, we need actually targeting information. What is the target? Where is it located? What are the coordinates? And what it is made up of, most important, because that is about how we select our bombs. So, this was, I mean, there was a slight disconnect and I think it's a, it goes to the credit of the then chief, it started with uh, A. Chief Marshal Tipness, that he said, yes, we could be called to do this option, so we need to study it. So, initially it was ground intelligence, so aage ki photo, piche ki photo, so only thing I said, I dinner khane thode ja to drop a bomb, so please give me the coordinate. But of course, and now you see in uh, the recent operations, uh, the kind of output that came, uh, it was fantastic. Sir, you know, you're a professional Air Force warrior. There was so much controversy and talk in the media. Ki mara nahi mara, gira nahi gira, sahi gira, galat gira. You know, what was going through your head when the Air Force had come out and said, we've struck successfully and you've got politicians of all hues saying, pata nahi kya hua, gira nahi gira and that became a big issue. See, we are responsible to the national leadership and uh, whatever information we have got, we presented to the national leadership. That is our job. And in any mission, whenever you do a strike, there is something known as bomb damage assessment. And uh, so that bomb damage assessment is carried out, okay, you wanted to hit so many targets, how many have we hit, uh, what have we missed, uh, you know, which bomb did not go where it is supposed to go. So that kind of analysis is carried out and then not only that, in your planning process also a lot of redundancies are built up. Okay, nobody says that I need only two bombs and I know it is never done like that. I mean, there is something known as over target requirements, the whole thing is built up and then based on which you build up a package, so a lot of things can happen, you know, if somebody can get intercepted, some aircraft can go down. So, end result you have a look that whether you have achieved your stated political objectives or no and I think that is exactly what uh, the government want to achieve. We hit a non-military target to tell the terrorist organization that if you perpetrate, uh, perpetrate uh, terrorist attacks in our country, no matter where you are, whether you are in POK or you are sitting in Pakistan proper, we will come and get you and I think that is what we did. The kind of precision ammunition that was used for this attack uh, was of a kind that went into the structure and detonated. After you saw the halabalu, ki building to giri nahi, chota hai che there, did you think we should have just gone in with a different kind no, of weapon and decimated uh, the whole at, building? At, at the outset, let me tell you, details over the operation are still classified, they have not been declassified. So, I am not going to confirm to you what weapon I have, we have used and things like that. <laughs> but it is sufficient to say that yes, we did the BDA and, and we realized that yes, our strike was successful. When Wing Commander Abhinandan Vartamans fighter jet went down and as somebody who had been part of an ejection yourself, you know, you ejected I think in 1988 from a MiG-21 yourself, what Air Chief Marshal was going through your head at that time? No, I know Abhinandan from the time he was a child. I, I, I knew his father, we did the FIS together and uh, I knew the family very well and uh, all that I did is I told, uh, you see in Kargil I lost my flight commander, Ajay Ahuja, he ejected and then after he landed uh, he was shot. So, that was playing on my mind that we must get him back. So, when he ejected and uh, I got in touch with his father, I told him, uh, Varta sir, I could not get uh, Ahuja back, but definitely we will get Abhinandan back. And that is a credit to the national leadership that we could <laughs> get him back in, in record time. So, you flew with Abhinandan recently, we will have those images back on our screen. I am very curious uh, to know what do fighter pilots talk about when they are flying? No, it is, uh, it is like this, uh, that uh, I was to, I, I, I was supposed to do my clearance, I have to return my flying clothing. <laughs> so, all those things, I said I have to come and fly one sortie before I have my uniform. So, I decided that okay, I will fly the sortie and uh, lucky for me, he, was, he had been medically cleared. So, I told him, I said the two of us will go in a two-seater and uh, he's got all his categories back. So, he sat in the rear and I sat in the front and we did the sortie. And, you know, course, and it also presented, I am sure everyone sitting here will agree, such a fantastic image of the Indian Air Force that you have got an officer who is down and you know the Pakistanis are trying to unnerve him and he's sipping and having chai. That is the swagger of an Indian Air Force job. That's just completely ultimate. No, his behavior uh, post his capture was exceptional. Let me start with that. If you see first of the few videos, he was blindfolded. He doesn't know. And all of us knew that Ahuja didn't come back. So, in spite of all that, uh, you know, the, the, his, his demeanor and his posture and the candidness by which he was speaking speaks very highly of his soldierly abilities. Actually, basically, we are all soldiers first.
So what do you think of the Park Air Chief Marshal? You are sitting in the front no, of a no, MiG-21. No, he has got an F-16. <laughs> F-16s are easier to fly. He is doing no, a no, joyride. No, no. I don't know. I, I will not comment on that because that is his prerogative what he wants to do. I don't know which aircraft is he qualified on. Why he was... Maybe if I was flying a Su-30, I also would have been in the rear cockpit. No, but he's an F-16 pilot. I say if he's... I don't know. May, it, see, it is not that... It is. See, aircraft so flies... modest. No, no. Aircraft flies based on laws of physics. Let's be very frank about it. Aircraft does not know whether it is a male, female, flying officer or air chief marshal inside. Okay. So when you want to fly an aircraft, you have to devote a lot of time. You have to go through your checks, procedures, emergency. You have to, you have to go through a simulator. And somebody has to clear you. Some qualified pilot clears you. I always fly a two-seater when somebody clears me. And then only I fly solo. It is not that uh, I am the chief, so I will go and fly. No, it is not like So you have to devote a lot of time. You have to have time when you should decide to fly. And if you so don't no, have the time, then I think you can only fly in the rear cockpit. Two things happened at that time. An Indian strike package went in. We took out terror targets in Balakot. And then there was a counter attack from Pakistan, in which uh, India has been consistently saying an F-16 went down. But so far, there has been no evidence. That Dusra pilot that Gafur speaks about, what do you think happened to that Dusra pilot? You see, pilot? the evidence, uh, unfortunately, the aircraft that uh, Abhinandan's aircraft did not come back. Normally, what happens is uh, we get the film and we get the kill. Like you saw all the Boira in the 71 war, all the kills that were there, we had gun camera films. These days, the, the, it is a beyond visual range combat. So you don't have gun camera films. But you have got films of the, of, of the multifunctional displays. You have got the flight data recorder, which says that, OK, when do you press the trigger and things like that. Unfortunately, those things didn't come back to us. But to substantiate our case, one was, of course, which we presented to the press of the radar picture and uh, track uh, vanishing uh, around the same time when uh, Abhinandan was very close to it. And the second was, of course, that Indian troops have seen in two different places, uh, two different aircraft coming. But what do you think about the ethos of an air force which has a pilot going down and doesn't have the courage to accept that a man went down? You know, that's almost like treating a soldier like a spy. No, I, I don't look at don't look at it in isolation. Don't look at it like that. What happened in Kargil? Did they acknowledge after Kargil that they, it was their soldiers? Did they come and, you know, after first, uh, they, did they come and take the bodies? Who buried the bodies? The Indian army with full religious rituals, you know, they buried the bodies on, on the site. After so many years, the president writes a book and said, no, it was my plan. Uh, so the next question he needs to answer is, why did you disown your own people? So it has nothing to do with uh, what Pakistan Air Force has done and the Pakistan Army has done. I think it is there in their culture, they always disown. But how do they so successfully make a body disappear? No. In India, we can't do anything of the kind. You know, if a no, plane no, no. goes have down, a, if a pilot have a, is dead, have a, there's a family. We have a far more vibrant press. You chaps grill us too much. <laughs> and not only that, we are a democracy, we have an audit process. In our case, you can't hide a, you can't, missing aircraft cannot be hidden, we can't do all that. And you are 170% certain that there is somewhere in Pakistan a grieving family where the boy went down and the country hasn't even acknowledged the death of that son. I don't know where is the guy and what is it because I don't have that evidence. Unfortunately, I don't have the evidence on that. But yes, we have. We are 100% sure that another aircraft went down in that sector. And the only aircraft, our aircraft in that sector was Abhinandan. Sir, this whole specter of the airstrike also brought alive in public imagination what has been in strategic circles for a long time. The fact that the Indian Air Force has a largely aging fleet. You optimally need 42, 45 squadrons, then the, the, amount, the number of squadrons required officially is 42. We are currently sitting at 30 and there also we've got uh, many uh, squadrons are now aging. The whole specter of having a MiG-21 take on an F-16. Uh, the F-16 had a missile which could go beyond visual range of 100 kilometers plus, whereas uh, MiG-21 only had a 40 kilometer odd range. Does that bring alive to you the need to step up the speed of modernizing the Air Force? No. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it, it's a two-step process. First of all, we have to, the aircraft that we are flying has to be made contemporary. That is why we upgraded the MiG-21 BIS into the Bison. We upgraded the Mirage 2000. We upgraded the MiG-29. We upgraded the MiG-27. See, the bison may be a third generation fighter, but it had an avionics of a fourth generation fighter. And in a beyond visual range combat, he had the avionics of a fourth generation fighter. May not be as good as Su-30. 
may not be as good as Su-30, but he, he had the avionics of the third generation. It was not my aircraft, Type 96, fighting against uh, F-16. And second thing in the beyond visual range combat, it is situational awareness, your, you know, the kind of uh, essay you have built up and the kind of uh, your fusion, data fusion that is taking place in your combat, all those things start playing a major role. Our fleet is old, of course our fleet is old. We are maintaining our fleet, that is why we are able to fly an old fleet. We have a plan, you know, the system is that we are supposed to get like the two squadrons of Rafale is supposed to come, one more squadron of Su-30 will get erected, then uh, the second squadron of LCA will come in uh, FOC configuration, then we have 83 LCA, four more squadrons of LCA will come in. So that will ensure that the drawdown will not, uh, let us go below 30. And then after that, we have, go, we have put an RFI right now, we do not have an AON as yet, of a multi-role fighter aircraft. So there is a plan that yes, in case of a two-front conflict to go to 42 squadron. But the question is, with 30, can you fight? The, what did we do in Gagan Shakti? In Gagan Shakti, the whole exercise in 2018 was aimed at, can we fight with what we have got? Can we shift our forces? Can we optimize? Can we maximize? And that is what we proved. It was actually to answer to ourselves that yes, we can take on an enemy. So, how much of a game changer is the Rafale as it starts coming? Rafale is the game changer that you can say it is a, a half a generation or something ahead of what uh, both sides have got. In avionics, in weapons, in missiles, your data fusion, in all these things, it is, I have flown that aircraft in France. It is, it is, it is far, far ahead. And I love the smile he has. You know, it's like a, it's like a video game that a kid is playing. Like, I like no, this no, PlayStation. That. You know, no, it's like you, you must, this you PlayStation must, rocks. You must understand a, a person like me who was always say driving a whatever Maruti or something. You put him in a Mercedes, so obviously he will happy. But but we have, you know, ultimately we'll have only 36 of these Mercedes. Do you think no, we no, need more? No, no. They, they, that it is the it is for the government to decide you know which is the fighter that is going to come that is their prerogative but uh, what i want to tell you is we have we are upgrading there is also a plan to upgrade the su30 okay so the su30 avionics and things like that can be uh, can become better like we have upgraded the big 29 and we have upgraded the mirage 2000 so we going to upgrade the su30 also do you believe that past governments have done great disservice to the air force and to india's national security by stalling india's military modernization that's a political question. I'll not answer it. <laughs> you know, that's like a missile came quickly swerved. He's moved away on the side, which is fine. I respect that. Um, sir, what do you think of the light combat aircraft? There are, you know, we are bringing in more squadrons of the light combat aircraft. There have been concerns about the DRDO's ability to deliver what the Air Force requires. And there's an ultimate concern that finally, while you need a Mercedes, what we'll have, I don't want to take any auto company's name, but you won't have ultimately the kind of weapon. You no, uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, the, the LCA as a replacement of a light combat aircraft of the MiG-21 is a better aircraft. I've flown the LCA. I mean, at about seven, eight, ten thousand feet, the fuel consumption that you get in LCA, in a MiG-21, you get it at uh, 33,000 feet. You know, that is the kind of... It has got a fantastic engine, it has got a very good uh, uh, radar, it has got a very good man-machine interface and the Mark 1A which comes in with ISA radar and things like that has got even a better performance. Yes, the program is running behind schedule and we need to uh, uh, rake up the, uh, the, uh, the production which HAL is doing, they are doing something about it so that we can start producing 16 aircraft in a year so that at least we one squadron starts coming out. So once that happens then you know the LCA will come of age. Whether it is it is it is definitely better, if not equal to the what the Pakistanis have got the JF-17. But you're also comparing with the MiG-21. No, no, no MiG-21. Also... It, it was supposed to come and replace the MiG-21. Okay, earlier. But even now, when you operate in the subcontinent, then in the subcontinent as compared to the fighters that they are inducting, this aircraft is better. So what's your reading of the current strategic situation in the subcontinent? We've seen Pakistan's prime minister, uh, we've seen multiple ministers constantly talk of nuclear war, almost making it seem as if it is inevitable that at some point in time over the next few months that there will be another military confrontation, this time possibly a larger military confrontation. I don't uh, look at it that way. 
I look at it, am I ready for a military confrontation? Answer to that is yes. That is for the political leadership to decide how the escalation goes. But am I ready for it? Yes, the Air Force is ready for it. In fact, uh, when I wrote my letter to all the officers when I took over in 2017 in the month of March, I told them, I said you have to be ready to fight a war in a very short notice. That is exactly, I told you, we exercise the same thing in Gagan Shakti. Are we ready for it? So, answer to that is yes, and that is up to, if the other side decides to, I don't think, uh, see there is some rhetoric that they build up for their own population, to tell their own population that we are doing something about it. That is their local, this thing. I, and their capability, we know what the capability is. It is not a two front war, I am going to, that, that is not an issue. Do you think that Balako changes the whole uh, strategic scenario in the subcontinent because Pakistan would have never really expected us to go to uh, Balakot and bomb their terror targets over there. Uh, they would have thought that there may be some kind of a surgical strike on the ground by another air force. This is completely beyond the realm of what their air force army expected. No, you must remember Paul, Pakistan has always underestimated our national leadership. Always. 65 wars underestimated Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri. They never expected him to open up the front and go to Lahore. And then they were surprised. They thought he will only be fighting only in Kashmir, in Chamjauria and things like that. They were surprised. In, in, the, in the Kargil conflict, they were again surprised. They never expected us to pull all our forces, get our buffer guns and get the air force into it and take them out. So they have always miscalculated. They have always miscalculated. So even now, after Pulwama happened, I think they, were, they had miscalculated thinking that our political leadership will not permit such a strike. It's not the air force is not capable. They know what our capability is. But they always were under the impression that uh, our leadership will not. So they got surprised by the uh, decision of the leadership. And uh, that is exactly why there were nobody anywhere near around. Near, at least in the 27th, we challenged them. In 26th, we had no idea. It was about 100 km. When the Pakistani Air Force came in the next day, the army says, we just, you know, we didn't have a target in mind. We just wanted to scare the Indian Air Force and show them that you are uh, mein aai, hum to din mein aai. They say that, you know, we came in broad daylight, they came in hidden, uh, they came hidden in the darkness. Do you believe the Pak Army and Air Force when it says our mission was only to demonstrate that we could drop bombs in the fields? No, uh, uh, two things. First of all, <clears throat> you go in at night if you have better technology, as simple as that. Otherwise, you don't go in at night. You got to have all weather capability. Okay. <laughs> Gulf War 1. Gulf War 1. When did the operation start? They all started night, at night. Nighttime bomb. Okay, the person with better technological asymmetry is the person who does it at night. If you are doing day, do it during day, and then obviously that means you you are lacking night capability. And the kind of whatever is floating around in the social media, the imagery that you see, वो पुराने ज़माने का black and white TV होता है ना जो raster scan जिसमें आ सकता है, वो उस तरह की imagery दिख रही है. Nothing. I, I don't believe that. And uh, it is their uh, their statement that we wanted to, but normally if you want to just indicate something, first of all the caliber of weapons is low. You always fire a lower caliber weapon, like uh, Israelis do it, they put a door knocker, you know, a roof knocker. They put a small bomb to tell the people, vacate the building, because we know there is an arsenal below and we are going to hit it after that. But the caliber is lower, first of all the caliber is very heavy. And secondly, many of them, this is not the, many of them fell within the safety distances. If somebody was outside, he could have uh, got killed. So I don't think uh, this is a. Do you think they missed their no, target? No, Do you think that specific the, the, target they a, wanted to hit a, and they a, missed? They, this is a spin that they have given after they have missed the target. So you are saying the Pakistani yes, Air Force had specific targets? See, our air defense had challenged them. Unlike in their case, their air defense had not challenged us. Our air defense had challenged them. That is, that is the difference between the two scenarios. What does this confrontation demonstrate about the military capabilities of both the Air Force in your view. No, no. The Pakistanis claim that because one Indian helicopter went down, because Vartaman went down, that they've got, they've come away strong. How do you see No, it? you see, uh, do, they are shifting the narrative to the tactical level. That is not the issue. Issue is, did we achieve our political objectives? Answer to that is yes. Did they achieve their political objectives? Answer to that is no. Otherwise, you know, in, they always go down to bean counting and things like that. It has happened, 71 war, they have taken out a book. They said that, no, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we had the same attrition level as the, in, uh, attrition rate, not level, attrition rate as the Indian Air Force. So, you call that winning. You lost half your country. 
You are welcome to such a battle again. <laughs> Sir, in this fog of war, an Indian helicopter also went down in self action. What lessons have we learned? No, from that? Uh, there were uh, there were some people who made mistakes. Uh, we have put first of all we put measures in place so that such a mistake does not happen. And uh, for the people who are responsible, the law will take its course. So, how have you seen the Indian Air Force and the Indian military change in the past four decades between the time you entered uh, straight out of academy in the Air Force as a young pilot to now? The world has changed. I used to fly with my heart in my mouth <laughs> in a MiG-21 thinking that I will not find my base when I come back. <laughs> and now the kind of systems and the systems that are there in all the aircraft, you know, all aircraft, airfields have got CAT-2 ILS and things like that. It is, it is a world, it is such a pleasure to fly these days, you know, compared to, but yes, that is what we had at that time. But uh, it is also our spectrum has, you know, our spectrum of conflict has changed. And uh, it has gone day, night, 24 hours, and like you said, this was subconventional to <clears throat> non conventional. The whole thing has changed. Over a period of time, uh, we have invested a lot of money in, in upgrading our technology, in upgrading our airfield systems. And uh, of course, upgrading our training. When we joined, very few aircraft had simulators. Now all aircraft have got simulators. There is a major, major change that has taken place across all fleets of the Indian Air Force. One of the other things that's changed is that we now have more and more women in active combat roles in the Indian Air Force. We've got women fighter pilots as well. Uh, there are those who would say, oh my God, what if Vartaman was a woman? Then what would have happened? How do you see this whole emergence of women power in the Air Force? No, <clears throat> Air Force right from the beginning inducted women in all branches. I mean, we initially they were in the ground duty branches, then we inducted them into the flying branch. So in our case, women entry was open to all branches. So for us, it was much easier to give them permanent commission as in when we were told that yes, the ladies have to get permanent commission. It was much easier for us to give them permanent commission. As far as combat missions are concerned, as far as combat missions are concerned, she is a soldier like anybody else. And she trained accordingly. There is no difference. And as far as the aircraft goes, the one in which she is fighting, I told you to gender neutral, it's like a car. Car ko thodi pata hai, bail hai female hai. And that's, that's such a strong message also to all the young women who potentially want to join the Air Force. Do you think that, you know, interest in the Air Force is skyrocketed after the Balakot air strikes was earlier, you know, you wanted to be a special forces commando, go in and you know, do a surgical strike. Now everybody wants to be Vartaman and Danoa. It's not that, that is how you feel. Everyone always wanted to be a fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, do you think uh, fighter pilots have a bit of a crazy streak in them? No, no, it's a little bit of a Why is it? How will you fight otherwise? <laughs> you got to have that streak in you. You know, because there are critics in the services and outside who say, Vartaman maybe overshot his brief. When he was called back, you know, the lady was calling no, him no, back, no, he had no. turned around and come he back. Is, he got excited, again he went over. You see, in the heat of battle, to sit in a sofa and decide what a person has done in the heat of the battle is not fair. Okay, at that particular time and that thing, you, you, it is dosh, it is, you, have a, you have a target in front of you and uh, I think the, for us to judge right now is not correct. It is, it is, he did what he thought was the best at that particular period of time. And what I am trying to tell you is that not only that, we are encouraging, in our case is not only, just not just the fighter pilot goes and wins the battle, no. We gave uh, fighter controller, the first I think lady in the history of the Indian Armed Forces to get a youth seva medal. Okay, and what was her role? She was the person who was directing, she was the person who made sure that the people, you know, uh, turned at the minimum about range so that all their amrams have missed. You know, firing their amrams from D-Max 1. So, so, you have to give her full credit, it's not only the fighter pilot, no. And, and she won a... You would say one Absolutely. So, as we conclude this session, last time the Indian Air Force went in and struck in Pakistan deep inside, the Pakistani Air Force was unaware. They didn't even think that this is possible. Next time, they'll be ready. If there is any kind of a terror attack, they'll be looking up towards the skies. Do you think we can go in, inflict even more damage or as much damage and come back unscathed? See, your force packaging, when you do your force packaging, 
the force packaging is done in such a manner depending on what is the threat and what is the level of readiness on the other side. If it is a total strategic surprise, then you don't have to have such a large force. If we know that he knows, okay, then you have to have a force package which has got other people, the EW people, the jammers and got other people will be there. Yes, you still, you know how to meet your objective. We have got a fantastic combination of Sukhoi 30 with the Brahmos for which they have no answer. Okay, so we have, we have got a lot of things up our sleeves. <laughs> You retire in a few days, you're looking forward to retirement? Oh yes, I'm looking forward to retirement. <laughs> Sir, I must say that uh, you have a ton or a missile of gratitude from everyone sitting here in this audience for what you and the Indian Air Force and the Indian military achieved in Balakot, showing the enemy that not just can we make a shallow incursion, we can strike terror deep inside Pakistani territory for having done that so successfully and for having come back with national honor and pride. Air Chief Marshal B.S. Danohan, every single Air Force warrior, you have our nation's collective gratitude. We thank you so much for joining us here at the India Today Conclave in Mumbai and we wish you all the best. And given how much you know, and how well he speaks, I hope that once uh, he's out of his uniform, you'll be a regular guest on India Today television. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for India's top gun, Air Chief Marshal B.S. Danoha.